Today on The State of Us, Ukrainian President Zelensky pleads for Biden and the United States to lead. Welcome to The State of Us. I'm your host, Justin T. Weller, joined, of course, today by the senior resident historian here at True Chat and an educator of 35 plus years, Mr. Lance L. Jackson. Today, uh, we come to you after having just recently listened to uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky's address to the United States Congress, where he said, quote, speaking directly to Biden and Congress, being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace and directly asking for a no-fly zone and for additional aid uh, and comparing much of what's happening uh, to Americans' own experience with Pearl Harbor and 9-11. Where are we going first, Justin, with this? Because I think both of us were moved very passionately by President Zelensky speak. For the last several weeks, uh, actually, I think since the invasion of Ukraine, since the week before the invasion of Ukraine, um, of the two new hours of content that we put out every week, we're dedicating 50% of all of our time uh, to Ukraine. So hopefully uh, it has not been, actually Lance was mentioning prior to the show, I don't think it has been since the 2016 election that the state of us has given this much time to anything um, on an ongoing basis. The the other closest thing might be the covering the Syrian civil war, um, where we would regularly on every episode update the number of days the war had been going on and the current um, civilian toll that it had taken. Uh, so, but as far as actual extended, uh, you know, coverage where we're really talking through things, I think this may be um, the most substantive. So hopefully that communicates to our listeners how seriously we take it. Um, I know that I have been uh, deeply frustrated by uh, the entire situation, angry um, at Russia, but also angry at the United States um, and our allies for our... It's not that I don't think the sanctions are immense. They're clearly wreaking havoc on Russia's economy. I think that much is clear. I also think that it's clear from President Zelensky's address uh, that that's not enough that it's not enough to stop Russia. It's not going to be enough to stop Putin. Um, And as much as possible, I think Lance and I are going to refer to stopping Putin more than Russia, uh, partly because I I think that it is clear that many Russians, probably a majority of Russians, don't want this. Um, Yet, it's very difficult to get a read on that because, again, for those that don't remember, in Russia, state media controls... Um, the messaging. It's very hard for them to get access to outside information, even via the internet, because a lot of that is censored. I don't know if you saw it, Lance, but um, actually a, a person that worked at uh, Russia Today, you know, Channel One in Russia, um, actually broke onto the set of a live broadcast and held up a sign in protest. That person is facing probably up to 15 years in Russia's prisons for Uh, that transgression. Because Putin put into effect a law that no one's allowed to criticize what the Russian government is doing. Basically, what what the law says is provide any misinformation. So the propaganda that he puts out is the real word and to tell the truth is punishable by 15 years in jail. So to your point, the Russians may be, you know, when you read about, you know, and well, 80% of Russians agree with what's going on. Well, they agree with what they've been told, which is not the truth because Putin controls the media. Again, the importance of a free media, right? We, we, we bash on getting one side of the other, but at least people are free here in the United States to talk. And that's what President Zelensky was pleading for. We want that same opportunity. We want the same freedoms that you in Western Europe and in Canada and most importantly, the United States as the leader of the free democratic countries in the world. We want to exercise those same rights that you take for granted on a daily basis. And in order to do that, we need your help more than while we appreciate what you've done, we need even more help if we are not going to be subjugated by this 
Russian atrocity. Yeah, a lot of uh, communication that, you know, this isn't just about Ukraine. This is about democracy around the world, what it means to be free, what it means to have freedom, um, and whether or not we're going to allow it to continue. It was not very, it was not a very long set of remarks. Um, but as we know from history, right, things do not have to be long uh, or drawn out to be impactful. And I think in this case, the short but powerful message um, was important. As I mentioned in the opening, <clears throat> invoking Pearl Harbor in September 11th, President uh, Zelensky of Ukraine delivered an urgent and impassioned plea to Congress for more military aid to defeat Russia, describing the threat his nation faces as an attack on the democratic values that are championed by the United States. The Ukrainian leader wearing a military-style t-shirt appeared tired but determined, repeating his calls for the United States to help impose a no-fly zone over his country to stop Russian air attacks. He called for the delivery of sophisticated air defense systems and combat aircraft and urged that more sanctions be added to those that have already crippled the Russian economy, demanding more action, quote, until the Russian military machine stops. And then again, addressing President Biden directly and in English for this portion, he thanked him for the U.S. support that has included well over a billion dollars in weapons in the last year, but urged President Biden to do more. He said, quote, being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace. And that was I mean, there was a lot of different things to take away from it, Lance. Obviously, the comparison um, to shared experiences, Pearl Harbor, September 11th, things, you know, obviously most of us probably not alive to really remember uh, the September 11th attack or the, excuse me, the Pearl Harbor attack. But uh, at least me, you, um, and many Americans other than the youngest among us can remember September 11th um, and what we felt. And he actually went on to say, and I think this is important to note, remember he explained that that's what's happening every night. Right. I mean, that's they are feeling that type of impact every night uh, with Russia tormenting them from the air and openly bombing uh, civilian areas. It's no longer just military targets, despite Russia's denial that they're not doing that. Um, if you haven't seen the video of the address, which includes a video that uh, that the government of Ukraine put together, highly recommend you watch it. It is uh, linked in a Wall Street, or excuse me, in a New York Times article, which I was just referencing at thestateofus.org. Um, so you can check it out there. You can also, I'm sure, find it, you know, YouTube or any place else you get videos. We have to remember that this is his second attempt to take over land in this area. He already has Crimea. And I say that because that's those are the same steps that Adolf Hitler took. And the world kept saying, well, we don't want to confront him because we're going to cause a war. And we remember the atrocities of World War I, and we don't want that again. And so they kept appeasing Hitler and nothing worked. And to me, that's exactly what's going on with Putin. And we can say, as you know, President Biden last week said, well, we, we may do more, but we're not going to put American troops in the Ukraine. And it's like, okay, what do you people expect to happen? You already allowed Russia to take Crimea in 2014. And they now have connected a land area. Now, it's disputed by the Ukrainians, but basically the Russians can now get troops and supplies through, and now they're going to establish a stronger presence in the southern part of the Ukraine because they now control, because they've controlled Crimea for the last six years. Bring another historical reference. It's the same thing that happened in Korea, right? We, we, we allowed the, the Chinese to come in and they took over the entire peninsula and it took General Douglas MacArthur to make an amphibious attack on the side and pinch and fight back to where we now have the 38th parallel, which has been there, you know, since the early 1950s. I mean, how much more do we have to sit by and watch Putin do these things and think, well, he's going to stop. You know, well, we really want to avoid war. I think, at least in my opinion, my under, my thought is 
the more we wait, the harder it's going to be to stop. And people may be out there saying, oh, but it could cause this and there's nuclear. Okay, folks, it's in my opinion, it's going to come anyway. All right. Because if you don't stop Putin, he's not going to stop with Ukraine. If he gets Ukraine, he's going to go after other free Soviet socialist republics. That's his, read his information, okay? He wants to create the old Soviet Union. That's 15 breakaway republics, okay? So he's not going to stop. He's been working on this for the last nine years. And remember, by the change in law that he changed, he's president for life. It's not that we can hope there's a new election and and Putin's not going to be there anymore, okay? As long as he's alive, he's going to keep trying to take more land. So when do you want to try to stop him? When do you want things to get worse? Do you want to push it down the road? Or do you want to deal with it now? And I think if you've listened to the show for any time at all, you know, my opinion is if you have a problem, you deal with it immediately because no matter what the fallout is, by dealing with it immediately, it's not as bad as if you put it off. How are the United States and NATO and the rest of the free world going to respond? Because we've basically been told, if you don't step it up and help us some more and take these, at least these risks, we're going to fall. And then what are you going to do? Are you going to allow a dictator responsible for the murder of innocent people to steamroll a democratic republic into submission and never mind the human toll? Uh, allow that to continue? Well, that's what we're here to answer. Keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. President Biden is planning to detail an additional $800 million in security assistance to Ukraine after Mr. Zelensky's speech to Congress, according to White House officials. Among Ukraine's requests are more anti-aircraft batteries that would enable the Ukrainian military to harass and shoot down Russian cargo planes and fighter jets. Virtual talks between Ukrainian and Russian representatives were scheduled to take place for a third straight day, the longest round of negotiations over a ceasefire in the three weeks since Russia's invasion began. Russia's foreign minister said on Wednesday that there was a certain, a quote, a certain hope that a compromise can be reached, end quote, and issues on the table included an agreement that Ukraine not join NATO. Uh, NATO defense ministers were scheduled to meet to discuss enhancing defenses along their eastern front as Russia's attacks inch closer to the alliance's doorstep. The meeting comes before next week's extraordinary NATO summit, where Mr. Biden is scheduled to discuss how to respond to Russia's invasion. Again, that information from The New York Times, available at stateofus.org. I think, Lance, the fact that Ukraine has been able to hold on for three weeks Uh, is two things. One, it's a testament to the strength and resolve of the Ukrainian people, first and foremost. Secondly, it's, I believe, an underestimation and or a debacle from Russia's planning. Um, I'm not sure... I'm not sure if it was Putin's delusion that he thought the people of Ukraine would welcome them with open arms. Um... Given what we know about him, I just have a hard time believing that he really thought that was possible. But maybe, maybe, you know, again, hard hard to know for sure. Uh, more realistically, it was a, you know, failure of adequate planning and a decision to not use overwhelming force immediately. Um, because, again, anybody that's under the illusion, you sort of mentioned this at the end of the first segment, Lance, but I think it's so important to drive home. Anybody that's under the illusion that Ukraine alone is going to prevent Russia's takeover of their country. I, I think I think that's a delusion. Um, again, without us taking extreme military assistance measures and or directly, you know, uh, fighting side by side with Ukraine. Ukraine all by itself in its current condition, which I think was part of Zelensky's point, it's just a matter of time. You know, Russia has the numbers. They certainly have the military um, and they have, you know, everybody doesn't really want to 
believe that it's possible, but they have the nukes, you know? I mean, if it comes down to it, none of the rest of that crap really matters, you know? None of it matters. Uh, if Russia decides to use one of its more than 6,000 nuclear warheads, um, they can defeat Ukraine. You know, that's, I, I think it has to be said unequivocally, Russia can win, quote unquote, win if they want. If their definition of winning is totally devastating Ukraine, that can be done. You know, now, are we going to do something to prevent that from happening? Because the other thing we talked about in the last episode, Lance, which I think is so important to mention, Putin's in end game is not, I can't see it being a graceful end game. If it becomes clear to him that he can't win, it's probably not going to be pretty. And I don't think that I don't think it's going to make hardly any difference whether or not NATO and the United States, you know, are directly involved or not. Because frankly, I have a hard time believing that he's sitting there talking to his advisors and saying, yeah, you know, NATO and, and the United States, they're not really involved in this. You know, I mean, are we kidding ourselves? I, I feel like we are, Lance. I feel like we're, we're in this in between, right, where it's like, well, we don't want to go any further because then that might that might make Putin mad. You know, he might look at that as an escalation. Are you kidding? Does is he not looking at what we've already done as an escalation? We have virtually ostracized them from the world economy. And that's not an escalation. That's not an affront. I mean, I don't think, again, to Putin, I can't see that he looks at this. He looks at this as an affront, just like he would, you know, if there were American troops standing in Ukraine. I, I'm not sure that at this point, the distinction for him is really there. Putin is very frustrated at this point because... The United States gave President Zelensky the stage that they gave him today by giving this speech, because that went out not just to the U.S. Congress, which was who he was directing it to, as well as he mentioned the American people. Um, but this is going out to the world. So um, that's going to upset Putin. So, and directly you know, asking Congress for ex these things. Exactly, right? But to talk about the debacle, I was reading another article that the Russian troops are out of supplies in certain areas because their supply chain, their supply lines are, are uh, in shambles and they are have now turned to, which is typical in war, to looting stores. You know, they're walking into grocery stores and they're walking into people's homes and living off the land, so to speak. You know, not, not farmland, but going into stores to get the supplies they need, to get the food that they need to stay alive because they, the Russian government can't supply them with the food and the necessities of life that they need. That's not surprising, but I just mentioned that. So you need to be aware that, that that's going on. Um, and I think this is the biggest thing for the United States and the rest of the world. We talk about freedom and democracy, but we have to quit just giving lip service to it. Are we going to stand, say that we stand for this, that we really believe in this, or are we just going to talk the game? Are we going to walk the walk, or are we just going to talk the talk? And right now, all we're doing is giving lip service. And you can say, oh, but we have sanctions, and oh, we've given a billion dollars in the last year to the Ukraine to help build up their military, which President Zelensky said thank you for. And you say, oh, well, President Biden's going to give another $800 million. Okay, but when are we going to get real? When are we going to stand up and say, this is what we believe in at any cost? And then as far as Putin going out gracefully, I will just throw this one in. We need to be pressuring China because the stop to Putin will come from the United States and NATO standing up to him and the Chinese going back to him and saying, you know what, dude, you're on your own. And then I don't know what that'll cause him to do, but I think that that's what's going to stop him without an all out type of war. And I think this is a time and we're probably doing it through back channels, pushing China. I've read a couple articles about it. You've got to do more to stop Putin. Now, they're not coming out and supporting him like they were. So it's already moving that direction. But to stop Putin, it's not only going to take the United States and NATO, it's also going to, to take the Chinese to step up and say, yeah, you know what? We, the Chinese, are only interested in ourselves and we can't get to where we want if we're going to back somebody like Putin. They've begun to take out civic leaders in these 
cities that they're trying to take over and put in puppet governments. So the support has not been there that Putin thought he was going to get. And so now they've resorted to kidnapping, I guess is the best way to put it, mayors and council people in some of these Ukrainian cities and installing their puppet governments a lot like the Germans did in France in World War II, um, putting puppet governments in who are going to do due diligence for the Russian government and try to get the local people to support the Russian government because it hasn't happened esoterically. It hasn't just happened out of the clear blue like, oh, yay, here comes Russia. Oh, you're not good. You don't want us here. OK, well, we're going to take out your elected leaders and put our people into power over your city. What would happen in the United States if somebody tried to do that? And that's what the Ukrainians are trying to stop. And I think we need to be standing there side by side with them. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, yes. I, I, I think that the China component is a big one to understand. China, China doesn't, China's, I'm sure, internally. China doesn't care about Russia. Very displeased China cares that this about is happening China. at all. <laughs> you know, if you guys don't, I think, I think our, our audience are bright people. They understand that. China doesn't really care about the rest of the world. China cares about China. Everything China does is to further enhance the power, both economically and militarily, of China. Okay? So understand that. If you don't, understand that. So they were supporting Putin verbally because they thought that was the best thing for them. They have no problem switching gears if they think it's in their best interest to walk away from Putin. And I think we need to make it innately a cl clear to them that they need to walk away from Putin. Because they don't want they, they don't want this. I'm sure they didn't want it from the beginning. It doesn't all it does is hurt them. You know, it, this does nothing to build their success toward being a world power because now you know, when they stood there with Putin, it's hard to know what Putin told them in advance. Um, but I have a difficult time believing that they would have said what they said if they knew that that within a couple of weeks of having said that Biden or Biden, excuse me, uh, Putin would invade Ukraine. You know, I mean, uh, that just doesn't seem like something they would have done because well, they knew or it they bought or they bought Putin's bill of goods that I'm going to invade Ukraine. And in a couple of days, right. it's going to be all right. over. It'll be. They said, OK, that's fine. Now we're three weeks into it. You know, it's three a big and a half mess. weeks into it. And it's a huge mess. Uh, yeah. And it's like, ah, uh, you got to you got to get out of this, dude. I, I think this if is... Biden and the U.S. government pushes China. Yes. A little bit, you know, puts a little pressure on them. I, I, I just really feel that they'll find a way to save face and walk away from Putin. And then Putin's isolated. And it's like, uh, now what do I do? Right. And the other thing to mention from what you said, because I think we have to be very clear with listeners what we mean by this. Um you said, by whatever means necessary. And people are sitting there, you know, well, what does that mean? Do you mean, you know, send them unlimited arms? Do you mean the no-fly zone? Do you mean send our troops in there? Are you talking nuclear weapons? What, you know, what what does by any means necessary actually mean? So let's talk about what the next steps are. Keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. By whatever means necessary, what does that actually mean? Well, a question I've been getting, Lance, um, in the past couple of weeks is, what can I, I being the average American citizen, do to help? What can I do to help? And that's a, that's a tricky one because... I think it's the wrong question for people to be asking. Yeah? What question should they be asking? How I think the question they should be asking themselves is, how far am I willing to go? Because is it wonderful that people are collecting money? You know, I saw different feel-good stories on the news where restaurants are selling food, people are collecting clothing, and they're sending it over there to the refugees, which we haven't even talked about, right? Poor Poland. 
Oh, you know, yeah. They, they, they are, they've accepted over a million and a half they're refugees. Just... And they're like, um, we don't have enough stuff to take care of these people, you know? So is it wonderful that Americans all across the country are stepping up and doing what they can to help those people that are trying to get out of this situation and survive this situation? I'm not belittling that at all. But when I say that's the wrong question to ask, what can I do to help? I think the question is, how far are you willing to go? Is that it? You're going to send them your old clothes and a hundred dollars, you know, to, to get food. That's wonderful. Don't, don't stop. If you're doing that, that's a wonderful thing to do. If you think that's going to stop Vladimir Putin from taking over the country of the Ukraine. With all problems on this show, I think we have tried Lance over the many years to endeavor to do two things. One, talk about how to address the root of a problem, right? And what to do about the symptoms caused by an issue. And this is one where we have to break it down, right? Collecting clothes, sending money, supporting uh, UNICEF. Those are tremendous things to do. Those are treating a symptom and they will not stop Putin. Those things will not stop Putin. Now, are they important to do? Absolutely, because we don't want the Ukrainians who have fled and sought safety. We don't want them to go hungry and die in the hands of, you know, humanitarian efforts because they're not supported adequately. So you should absolutely be doing that. So if you're asking yourself how you can help, yes, donate to UNICEF. There are lots of great articles. Uh, Global Citizen has 27 meaningful ways you can help Ukraine. Um, the Guardian asked the question, what's the most effective way to help? Um, and they come up with three primary ways. Um, so again, uh, I, I think those, those things are worth doing, absolutely. Um, at the same time, building off of what Lance just said, how far are you willing to go? And hopefully the answer is at this point, we are willing to go to the extent of putting American lives at risk. Because frankly, and hopefully you've picked up on this in the rest of the show, they are at risk anyway. Allowing this to take place in 2022 risks anybody that lives anywhere in a democracy. It, and I don't think that's extreme. I think that's just the truth. If the world, particularly if the United States and our European allies, who basically all of whom are some form of democracy, stand by as a democracy of 40 million people is subjugated by a dictator, that is a threat to all of us because it will not, I don't know how many times we have to say that, it will not end there. If Putin is successful and gets Ukraine, it's not over. It wasn't over with Crimea. It's not going to end with Ukraine, you know, if he's successful. Now, if he's not successful, modern Russian history over the past hundred years tells us that Russia is probably going to get rid of him. Because they don't take kindly, that includes the oligarchs and the other people other than Putin that actually have some power, who have been on Putin's side, but they've only been on his side because why? As we've talked about before, they respect strength. And a debacle in Ukraine costing literally, you know, millions upon millions of United States dollars in Russian money, right? Wreaking havoc on Russia's economy and turning the public against you. That's not what strength is, right? That's the opposite of that. That's not what the oligarchs want to support. They want to support somebody who, when they say they're going to do something, it's done the way they said, and it's done effectively, and it makes them stronger. And if Putin loses, some of that support evaporates. He's not invincible, you know? And I think that's the other thing that's made me upset with our response, Lance, is it's treating it like we need to be concerned. And I... And from a strategy standpoint, do we have to think about what Putin's going to do in response? Absolutely. Do we need to be concerned about Russia looking at it as an affront? No. I Again, I think they already see it that way. You know, uh, they're, I'm sure, thinking about Lance because they're, they're not, you know, they're not stupid enough to not think about this. It's not a question of, for them, if NATO gets involved, it's just a question of when and how they want to handle that, you know? Um, and I'm sure they've gamed that out and talked about it. So, uh, 
I don't know what else to tell people other than you have to ask yourself how far you're willing to go. And I hope that you arrive at where I'm at and where I think Lance is at, which is going back to that by any means necessary, which to be clear, Lance, what does that mean? Does it mean, does it mean we're okay doing airstrikes? Does it mean we're okay sending unlimited military equipment? Does it mean that we're okay sending troops? Does it mean those things? Is that what by any means necessary means? It does to me. Okay. Any means necessary means you do whatever you have to, to get Putin out because Putin is the problem. It's not necessarily the Russian people. It's, you know, and so doing all those other things that you talked about, you're right. We are honest here. That's what we we have honest conversations. The problem here is Putin. And I will just go a step further and say, okay, so Crimea was 2014. If you, if Ukraine is 2022 and then, Russia goes silent for a few years. Putin <clears throat> passes on naturally, you know, has a disease or he's getting up in years, you know, he passes on naturally. Well, what have you established for his successor? The fact that, well, Putin took Crimea, he took Ukraine. Now they get a new leader and it's like, well, now I'm going to go take the next step. I'm going to continue this because everybody's afraid of of Mother Russia. And that's why you have to stop Putin because even if Putin were to go away through natural causes and this turns into a quote, air quote here, victory for Russia, that they got Crimea and the Ukraine, the next Russian leader will continue to try to reunite the old Soviet Union. That's, in my opinion, why you have to stop it now. To your point, the Russian oligarchs are losing billions and billions of dollars right now, okay? They're not going to stand for this. So if we make Putin look bad, then through any means necessary, I don't think the Russian people and government will revisit trying to take over these countries for a long, long time. They'll have to get rid of this stain that's on them by what Putin has done. If Putin loses. But if you allow him to be victorious, then the follow-up Russian leaders will just continue what he's doing because that will have been, well, he was successful. I'm going to keep, and they're going to keep trying to take more land. That's why I think you have to step up, as you point out, by any means necessary, whatever it takes to stop the Russians from taking the Ukraine must be done or this will continue to be an issue that the United States and the rest of the world has to deal with in the next 15 or 20 years. So if you don't stop it now, it's just something we're going to keep revisiting every two or three years, every five years. What what, what does Russia want now? And it may happen faster than that. But it, it doesn't go away unless you get rid of Putin. Yeah, at some point you have to draw the line in the sand and be ready to defend whatever that line is. And I would rather, as I've stated as a historian and my own personal opinions, I would rather do that now, no matter what the outcome, because you know what? The longer you wait, the outcome's not going to change. And it could be worse. Okay. It's not going to get better by waiting. It's not going to get any better by waiting. So what's the sense in waiting? Quit giving lip service to freedom and democracy. We either believe in it or we do not. Uh, and if we believe in it, then we have an obligation to defend it. And the, I think the reality is I think it does get worse. I, don't, I, I think letting, right, letting the invasion and seizure of Ukraine take place, uh, the more countries that Russia overtakes – you're gaining people. You're gaining economic, you know, power. These are, again, why why is Russia not as powerful as it was during the Soviet Union? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but one is that it controls substantially less territory than it used to, you know. And now we're just going to seed back territory that, mind you, those places don't want to be part of Russia. It's not like, right? I mean, th the whole equation is different. If Ukraine was like, oh, yeah, you know, we want to go back to Russia. OK, fine. But that's not what's that's not what's happening, you know, as anybody watching would know. And we spent 40 plus years and trillions of dollars fighting the Cold War to cause the fall of the Soviet Union and the breakup of the Soviet Union. And you and now we're just going to watch. That be undone. By an authoritarian dictator. 
We worked all those years post-World War II and spent all that money and all those troops and all that, those negotiations and everything to lead to the downfall of the communist bloc in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And now we're just going to let them build it back up again. Did we not learn anything? I just leave people with this, Lance, because I've been thinking about it all show and I want people to think about it. I'm not, we're not going to dive into commenting on it, but World War II comes to mind, right? And how did the United States win World War II? By whatever means necessary. For those of you not fully familiar with the history, remember that the conclusion and the unconditional surrender of the Japanese in World War II came after what happened. Any means necessary. Now, does that mean that I'm suggesting nukes? No. I'm saying in order to win that war, we had leaders at the time who decided that there was nothing that we wouldn't do to bring a conclusion to this war. It's an attitude, not an action. Exactly. And right now, that's not the attitude we have. It's how, how many steps back can we stand, you know, and not get too dirty while also giving a lot of lip service to thinking that, you know, Ukraine's great. Um, and they are. It's not that that, it's not that what's being said is untrue. It's that that's not being backed up with action. So think about whatever means necessary and where you're at on that. Send us an email, podcast at thestateofus.org. We'd like to hear from you. Why do we have this conversation today, Lance? Well, because here at True Chat, we have a mission, and our mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. I think we've done that extremely well today, and we do want to hear from you. And we want you to have these conversations with your families and friends and coworkers. And when you're having these conversations and they say, well, you bring up some good ideas, you know, where did you get some of this, sir? Have you heard this before? Say, sure, and tell them about the state of us and tell them as a podcast, they can find us on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, and everywhere podcasts are found. State of Us is available Tuesdays and Thursdays, first thing in the morning as a podcast, and we're heard on the weekends in on AM and FM radio stations around the country. For the State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to our producer, Bradley Butch. And the last thing I would say to people, if you really want to help and you decide by whatever means necessary is what you need to do, it is time for you to contact your congressperson, senator, right? And get your friends to do it. And you say, well, they don't want to do it. You know, too much time, too much effort. Okay, well, write, the res write it up for them. And ask them if you can submit it on their behalf, right? I mean, again, if enough people make sure that Congress knows, and Congress is already starting to lean that way of being willing to do more to help, be the push, right? Be the reason that your representative votes yes. And don't let it end with, well, me saying it's not going to be enough. You're right. It's not going to be enough for you to say it. So get your friends, get your family to say it. Get everybody you know to say it. Take the, take the time it is time and prove that you actually care about Ukraine by taking that time to make sure that it happens. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in thestateofus.org.